Okay. Hi, Rob. How are you? I'm doing so good. It hurts. How are you? Awesome. Um, so busy. I can't breathe, but that's a good thing. Uh, good I have started. Sometimes. To, sometimes it is, I guess. Yeah. Well, to that end, I have started to clear out my to-do list a little bit, and I hope to actually hey. be able to take a little time off starting in June. But we'll see. It's all up the air. So time off is lovely. Yes, it is, and I miss it very much. Okay, so for today's AMA, I thought what we'd do is a little warm up, kind of like quick fire, uh, just to get our conversational, you know, ideas flowing. Mostly because sure. I haven't seen you in a while. How have you been? It's been a minute. Yeah, I'm doing doing good. Doing good. I was actually uh, out uh, vacation last week. Um, the kids had kids up here in the Northeast had spring break, so um, nice. that's uh, that's why I was I was in weird surroundings when we chatted uh, at Emberconf. Yeah. Um, so pandemic, right? Where I don't yeah. know. Are we still in it? Coming out of it? Getting through it? I'm not sure yet. Uh, Time is you know what? Right? That is not a question I am qualified to answer. <laughs> well, we've all had our survival mechanisms, so I thought I'd ask you some quick fire questions. Did you dot dot dot? Did you learn how to grow plants? No, but I learned how to kill some. Oh, well, that's I'm an expert at that, actually. If you ever need advice. Well, we had some we had some invasive plants that were uh, oh. kind of like encroaching some of the. I want to say it's kudzu, but I can't remember exactly what yeah. the name of it is. But that anyways, it was like uh, doing some some encroachment um, that uh, we had to we had to, um, construct a flamethrower to get rid of. Wow, that sounds ambitious. Uh, did you learn fun. how to <laughs> Did you learn how to bake bread? That's a popular. Uh, so this is a strange question. So okay. I do bake bread. I did bake bread during the pandemic, but I have learned, I've known how to make bread for a long time. I generally make most of the bread that we eat uh, oh. for a family. Now I got much better um, mm -hmm. at, uh, during the pandemic. I, um, uh, be, but because I, uh, I had been sort of a baker for a long time, I had like a pound of yeast um, that, that I just had, um, which yeah. a pound of yeast is a lot of yeast. Um, and so, uh, and at the time I made mostly, um, uh, non sourdough. Um, and so, uh, if you recall, there was a great yeast shortage. It was mostly about, um, not being able to get the packaging, not about the yeast itself, right. but anyways, uh, but I had a bunch, I, I started sending, uh, batches of yeast to, to friends, uh, like to, to my brother, for example, I gave him like a whole, like, a, I think a half a cup or a cup, which is again, a lot of yeast, but yeah, um, uh, not, not that much in terms of the grand, grand scheme of a pound, I guess. Uh, so I was lucky in that regard. Um, and, oh, and I, we also had um, 50 pounds of flour just because I buy it in 50 pound bags. So we had a lot, we, we, we were, uh, we weren't like, hoarding beforehand but it just turns out we yeah, had yeah, yeah. Uh, we had a nice supply so but nice. since then i've uh really amped up my sourdough game uh now i'm nice. primarily baking with sourdough so oh, man both uh, sandwich breads and uh sort of like um country miche type yeah type yeah thing. yeah that sounds lovely oh i'm gonna you're gonna have to open a shop or something send me some did you, okay, here's some more. Did you buy a Peloton? Um, also a complicated question. I have a Peloton, <laughs> but I don't, but I think we got it in October of 2019. Not, uh, so, so I think uh, the answer so is, so I, I don't one. know. Does it, does it count? Maybe you set yeah, the does trend. It count? I don't know. Yeah. Did you color sort your books? Um, no. How about reorganize your cable management system? Uh, I took everything apart and put it back together again a couple of times. Yeah. Okay. Okay. What about an air fryer? Did you try out one of those? Um, well, an air fryer is really just a convection oven, which I do have, but um, oh, okay. uh, I use uh, my toaster oven um, is not a convection oven, but um, I did switch from a toaster, like a slot toaster to a toaster oven. So I'm going to say yes. 
Yes. Okay. That's a, that's an acceptable one. Um, now I know you play the ukulele and very well. Do you, did you learn a new instrument? No, I, I did not. I did not. I did. Okay. Um, I, I've been, I don't know, playing the ukulele off and on for two or three, four years. I don't know. A long yeah. time now ish. I don't it's know. It's been a while. Been a while. Yeah. I, I can't remember time, uh, time dilation, uh, mm. I guess is an effect, but um, I, um, I still, I still take lessons. I still uh, try to get better, but mostly now I just uh, play for fun. Um, just to noodle around and uh, as something to do with my hands uh, while I'm thinking about other stuff. But uh, I didn't learn any new instruments uh, specifically now. I tried. Uh, I bought myself a cello and then I discovered that I have very short fingers. So uh, that's not the best for cello that, playing. Wait, is that a feature or a bug on the I cello side? I think it's side? a bug on the cello okay, side. Yeah, okay. yeah. Okay. No, you really need the long fingers to get the notes right. So I own a very beautiful huh. instrument, but I went back to the ukulele because it's small and fits in my hands. So. Yep. Yep. All right. Um, is I love it because everything you make with it sounds happy. Yes, that's true. It just cheers you up all the time. Is there anything new that you did pick up that you want to tell folks about? Oh, uh, I don't know. Um, I've done a lot of stuff. I started running. I did my first Ooh. half marathon in February. Um, wow. I did not die as evidenced by my presence here. Um, well done. So Congratulations. I, 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 I did better than I expected to do, but uh, still got room for improvement. I, I did it in two hours and 18 minutes. Uh, plus some seconds. I can't remember right now, That's but um, I'm doing another, my next one will be in November and I'm going to shoot for sub two hours. So nice. that's uh, it's a bit, of, a bit of time shaving, but we'll, uh, we'll, we'll see if I can get there. Incremental progress, right? Yeah, exactly. Yeah. So what have you been working on lately? Well, the so um, things. yeah, so, so I think uh, the biggest thing um, internally is, is uh, LinkedIn is sort of helping um, uh, push forward embroider adoption and try to um, ready things for our apps, um, trying to get, trying to get things sort of in um, good order for internal things. We have some, some differences from like a normal and rep, for example, we don't tend to use um Broccoli Asset Rev for fingerprinting. Um, mm. So we had to we had to implement uh, you know uh, patches and workarounds for our fingerprinting solution and whatnot. Um, now, thankfully, uh, Ed's been helping a bunch. Um, we have another couple of folks that, that work with uh, work on the team, um, and uh, you know they've, they've been doing all the work. I, I just talk to people mostly is <laughs> is my job now apparently. You're the convincer. So, um, yeah, yeah, yeah. The convincer, the cajoler, the uh, you know, the, the shoulder to cry on, I don't know, all, all of the, all of the things. Yes. Awesome. Um, so you've been working on the web for how many years now? Uh, mm, I ran out of fingers. So oh, more than okay. 10. So I got socks on, time. so I can't count them. Yeah. Toes. Um, yeah, so a long, a long time. I don't know exactly how long, but in that context, have you seen anything lately that is exciting to you or interesting? Well, uh, so it's a bit, um, there, so yes, but I think the, the, <laughs> the thing is that it tends to go in cycles, um, and, or it, it seems to me, um, a lot of the stuff that um, is exciting to me now is the same stuff that was exciting to me 10 years ago. Not to say it went away in the middle there, but things like focusing on experience and, um, you know, getting up to ha having um, tooling, like, do like the right thing instead of uh, having to have the person sort of figure a bunch of stuff out. A lot of really awesome stuff coming through on the TypeScript front. Um, I think, uh, especially in especially in Ember apps, though I know that was a more general question, especially in Ember apps, it's like massively more convenient um, to use TypeScript in Ember today than it was even just two years ago. Um, okay. and, uh, and I think we're only gonna get better. I think a lot of that is uh, Ember's alignment with 
uh, more normal JavaScript. You know, TypeScript has gotten better. I'm not saying that that's not true, but the uh, the the fact that it's just less of a pain in uh, in our devs' hands is is a lot be, a lot because we just stopped doing stuff that was painful. Like TypeScript is is a wonderful tool, and a lot of times when you migrate to it and you feel pain, it's really telling you that your APIs yeah. were kind of crap to begin with. Uh, <laughs> so that, that's a that's a thing. Yeah. So I was looking at the um, PR for the interactive mode implementation in Ember CLI. Um, I know that we originally designed, wrote that RFC with accessibility in mind, but there's other purposes that can serve. What do you think uh, the good defaults or the right defaults look like for that? Uh, well, I think the the you know the original the original RFC I think was largely framed in terms of like the language flag and whatnot. Or at least that was the impetus. I know when we were chatting about it, but yeah. um, I think that. Uh, two things. First of all, I kind of, as I mentioned before, like the experience of using command line tools is like important. And mm -hmm. it's often the case where you'll invoke the command line tool. It'll be like, but, but you don't know exactly what arguments it needs or something to that effect. And then you end up getting like, did you mean X? And you're like, yes, just do that, man. Yeah, yeah. Come on. Read my mind, what are you please. doing? <laughs> um, and, um, and, and so I actually think that just Ember new enter is already a massive improvement, even if it doesn't prompt me for anything other than an app name, like it's still way better. Um, I can't tell you how many times I, uh, I forget to put an app name or I forget some flags or whatever. Um, I think, um, I think the, the number of questions that we ask and prompt people for is really important to stay quite small or the mm -hmm. app generation experience becomes kind of trash in mm -hmm. my opinion um i think uh I, I think that we have a pretty reasonable sweet spot right now where we only have a couple of questions i think we ask and i think we default to everything like you can basically yes. call ever new and then enter a bunch of times enter, and, enter, uh, enter, with enter, the exception yeah. of an app name we can uh we can just do the do the thing um the um, the, the, the things that I think are important are deciding whether you want to use yarn or NPM as an example, mm -hmm. we could, I can imagine the prompt for that. Although I think it, it shouldn't just be those two. It should be, you know, arbitrary, uh, like PMPM PM or, um, yarn two or three, uh, th those kinds of things. Um, mm -hmm. I think, um, also, um, uh, but again, the oh, uh, sorry, the other one was CI providers. I think CI, CI provider mm. is uh, is a new flag that you can already give, though I don't think the the wizard yet does that. But um, the um, th we added the flag as uh, you know, sort of the path off of uh, being tied to Travis Yaml, um, as Travis CI was sort of. I'm gonna say going defunct though. I don't know exactly if that's the right terminology, but for us, for open source purposes, it became basically not useful. Um, and we need to migrate to GitHub. And yes, that took way longer than it should have taken, but um, I guess that happens sometimes. The uh, So we added the CI provider flag um, and we can, right now, I think the only options are, I think are Travis and GitHub uh, though. Um, my, in, in the thread, when we were ch chatting about, it, I think the long-term goal is it can be somewhat arbitrary. It can be, um, mm -hmm. anything it could be another package name that provides the provider. Um, I think a lot of folks probably, uh, are using either an in-house CI solution, um, where they're not using GitHub actions, but they're using some other thing and the configuration is different. Um, and I think it's, Kind of annoying that they're going to continue to get um, a GitHub Actions file when they can't use it, for example. Um, uh, so okay. I think we should continue fleshing, continue fleshing it out. Or uh, lots of folks use Circle CI, right? There's nothing wrong yeah. with that. It works good. I think uh, GitLab has a nice CI setup. I forget what it, the name of it is, but you know, there's all the there's lots of different options. Um, I think. At, if you sort of put on your way back hat and you think about uh, the genesis of why did we pick Travis? The answer is it was basically the only one that worked. Uh, yeah, like it was the only right, one that offered right. open source. Uh, it mm -hmm. was it was effectively uh, bootstrapping the whole concept. Um, and now there's just a lot more options. Um, yeah. You know, so so I want to continue fleshing it out. I think that is a reasonable prompt in the wizard as well. Yeah, definitely. Um... I remember when we had to call ourselves full stack developers because you just had to be a to put something on the web. You had to know how to yeah. set up servers and do all that stuff. And now you can just 
not. It's great. Anyway, yeah, um, I started with server stuff and then moved to front end. And I can tell you, uh, I'm not sad to not be doing um, a lot of server side stuff right now. Yeah, I re I remember a particularly tricky um, multi WordPress a WordPress site, a multi site installation on a Windows server. That was particularly not fun. Yeah. So I I'm definitely glad to be where I am these, today. Um, yeah. Do you have any kind of, when you think forward to CLIs, like Ember CLI has been so inspirational for other CLIs and that's pretty cool. Um, I know I worked recently with a tool that didn't, with a framework that didn't have any generators in their CLIs. And uh, I definitely miss, you know, Ember generate component, my component. Um, what do you see the like the future of CLIs? Have you thought about that at all? Like, what do you envision people will add next? Or uh, do you mean like in that? the Ember CLI space, or just more broadly? Um, either both. Uh, I think on the Ember side, I think we have a bit of work to do to. Um, recruit and bring in more contributors, newer contributors. Um, not necessarily newer, but uh, uh, as uh, you might have noticed, I've been doing less overall maintenance these days. Um, I talked mm -hmm. about it at the core team panel a little while back, but I'm just doing somewhat less. Um, and uh, and I think it's it's really it's been great to see uh, other folks jump in and, and pick up. And we need to continue to be uh, to get better at enabling. Um, other contributors and other people to sort of step in and uh, start picking up the torch. I think um, in Ember CLI space specifically, I think we um, really were at the forefront of uh, at least front end framework uh, experience there for a long yeah, time. Yeah. Um, and I think unfortunately um, we've lost a bit of ground there and uh, mm -hmm. Um, not in the sense that it's gotten actively worse, but it's just not gotten better and others are getting better. And I think we need right. to continue to, um, you know, uh, hone our experience, uh, remove customizations, remove uh, sort of bespoke stuff in favor of more, I'm going to say normal, but uh, more popular um, packages th that, uh, that already exist in the node space. Uh, again, if you put, if you think about it in terms uh, of when we did it, like, a lot of those things didn't exist yes. or yes. certainly weren't popular then. Um, and now they just, now, now the world is different. And, and just like Ember sort of learned in that same exact way and made Octane, Ember CLI needs to probably go through a non-trivial refactor. For example, the commit, all of the objects that are in that system uh, extend from a thing called core object and core object was, um, was trying to emulate Ember's core object or Ember object base class with extend and create functions. But, um, also bend the curve on how native classes work with super and whatnot. And when I added the supering ability there, I just did it in a complete, like, it's just, it's just bad. The reason you have to call this dot <laughs> underscore super dot like thing that apply is just because I didn't do it right. Um, but uh, because people subclass those, those objects, um, they, they necessarily have to continue to work. So we need to, we need to do a bit of work to sort of massage our way off of them, um, much in the same way that uh, Polaris is trying to do the same thing um, for Ember object derived things as well. I, I think there's totally a path, but that's the kind of work that I'd like to see happen in CLI. Also like dependency upgrades and getting things up to sort of more modern um, uh, depth versions. Um, I would like to see, we need to be getting to embroider by default um, uh, hopefully soon, um, at least for add-on generation. Um, I know yeah. Embroider has a add-on blueprint that you can totally use and it works good um, for generating a V2 add-ons, uh, but we need to continue the work to solidify that and get that nailed down in an RFC so we can make it default for the Ember add-on command. Um, uh, yeah, so, so I think those are the kinds of things that I, um, I'm i really looking forward to. On the on the other side, the non-Ember side, because you did say either, oh, yes. um, I, uh, yeah. I'm personally quite excited about um, things like the GH uh, command, um, the, the GitHub CLI basically, um, and their custom extension support where you can write your own custom extensions. Um, they can be native code as well. I, I've been playing with writing some in Rust, for example, mostly as a, as a mechanism to learn Rust. Um, 
because I am a long time dynamic language person. So it's going to take a, a <laughs> while to really nail the idea of, uh, of, of the static compilation and, and all that jazz, but it's, it's a fun, it's a fun experience. Um, and, uh, and writing Rust CLIs, generally speaking is, uh, it, it, writing them is, is fairly quick. And also they, their startup time is much, much faster than node startup time. So for things that are, um, the, for things that are quick, like just munging of data or using pipelines or something, um, you can end up doing stuff a lot quicker. Um, and uh, I know, so so I'm personally uh, in the terminal all the time. Like I don't use VS Code yeah. personally. Um, I use Terminal Vim um, and uh, sometimes Emacs as well. Um, and uh, so you know, so so terminal experience, like the command line experience, is quite important. Um, and, uh, you know, I, I think making things not take forever, like every time my prompt reloads, it, it shouldn't take, you know, 500 milliseconds, which is what it took for like NVM to re-execute itself, uh, stuff right. like that. Um, right. You know, so I think those are, those are areas where things are, things are going to continue getting better. And I am learning and trying to improve my skill set there too. Awesome. You know, you were talking a little bit about um, getting some contributors to help out with Ember CLI. Um, what kind of characteristics do you look for in potential core contributors? Um, do you have any, and do you have any tips for engineers who might watch this and think, oh, I want to level up, I'd like to contribute to Ember CLI. Um, what should they keep in mind while they do that? Um, so a few things. So first of all, I think Ember CLI is a great code base to jump into because it is um, constrained. It, 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 the, the the constraints are much clearer. It's like a quote unquote normal node uh, CLI, um, unlike whereas uh, in Ember itself, there's there's things you have to know to understand some of the details of why things are structured the way they are. Um, a lot of that's getting better. It's like way better in Ember than it was before. But um, but I still think Ember CLI is a, if you're familiar if you work in Node if you're familiar with that dev dev pipeline using Mocha for tests that kind of stuff. Um, I think it'll be easy to jump into. As far as what folks should do, I think the the first thing is um, just do it. Uh, you know, find something that is wrong or needs work and dive in and uh, try to figure it out. I think the big, uh, a big thing that we're struggling with on the, the current uh, CLI core team and, and other core teams is exactly how to, to get that maintenance done. Like basically get the PR yeah. reviews done, get the issues triaged, at least to, to get a comment back to someone to say a path or direction or a, hey, we don't think this is a bug. Like it's pretty frustrating to be in a position where you're willing to do work on fixing something, but uh, you, you're not sure where even to bootstrap. Um, so anyway, so I think just diving in and, uh, you know, fixing something that's troublesome for you, um, or, uh, you know, a pain point you have, I think that is, is, uh, is a great way to start. Um, I think, um, personally, I think another really big, important thing to do is write up a good description, whether it be for an issue or a pull request, um, either way, um, in, in, in both, you want to really explain what's going on. You don't want to just fire off a pull request with like a poorly worded title and no body or, or whatever. And like, I'm not trying to say that the description needs to take longer than the PR itself, but it should be really, really clear the intent and the point of why you sat down to do some code um, and from reading the description. And a lot of times it's not. So you're, you're stuck reading the code to figure out what were, like, what was the real user problem here that they're solving? Like, oh, I see they added a guard in this nested place over here, for example. Um, but they don't really all, always talk about, um, like as a user, I sat down and did X and it did Y, but I expected Z. Right. Like that, th that's the kind of thing. Um, it doesn't have to be quite so formal as, uh, you know, uh, my Ruby is going to come up, but like cucumber specs, basically, but it, it, it can be, um, it should be uh, very clear uh, what the broken expectation you had was and why the, either the fix needs to exist or um, what you've tried, if it's an issue, what you've tried, you know, hopefully concrete reproduction steps, which includes cloning a repo and uh, installing depths instead of um, like, I had this snippet of code and I, uh, Good luck. Um, I don't know. Yeah, definitely. Um, I remember Joseph's PR 
on the for the Ember New Lang flag. And uh, that was a really well, I don't know, I think he does better than I do at his PR descriptions. Um, and you kind of sort of answered my next question, which was what makes a PR easier for you to merge? Um, and do you have some tips? But I think making sure folks really have that great description in there to reduce the mental load of the reviewer and the context, give right. the context for the reviewer really helps. Yeah. yeah. And I think uh, like other things, like make sure there's a test, right? Um, yeah. There are cases that are impossible or the difficulty of adding a test are so high that it may not be worth it. But um, if you think that's the case, you should say that in your description and explain uh, why and ask the, the, the maintainers, do you think that's okay? Or do you have an idea of how to do a test? Or do you know of another test where I might be able to copy the setup from or something to that effect? Um, instead of just saying it's an impossible to test or not testing and not saying anything about not testing and thinking that's fine. Um, I think, especially for Ember CLI, and uh, it's like, quite important that the thing actually works. People are using it all the time. Onboarding experience for Ember goes through that pipeline. Um, people read the guides, the main guides, the onboarding uh, and whatnot. And it just, it needs to work, you know? And there have been a times, uh, hopefully short duration overall, because hopefully we jump on them pretty quickly, but there've been times when it's been broken. And that's a pretty, um, I don't know, it's pretty bad. It's pretty, it's it's a pretty rough experience when someone sits down, oh, I want to learn Ember. And then they do Ember new foo and things blow up, right? Like that's, that sucks. Um, you know, so anyway, so explaining um, tests are important there, explaining um, what the test cases do and having the test cases be as close to the real life user thing that you ran into as possible, I think is good. Um, Outside of the Ember CLI space, uh, the the other thing that's quite important to to try to do is try to avoid mocking in the tests, if at all possible. Um, construct the units uh, such that they can either take a, you know a fake collaborator or uh, some other mechanism. But when you reach in to some third party object and replace methods, and you're just asserting those methods are called, that doesn't really prove that your case that you care about actually works anymore. Um, yeah. It just means that you called some method. What if that method goes away on the collaborator? You know, I, like th those those tests will still pass and real life is broken, right? So right. it's just a, it's a way to think about it. Like you want your test to be as close to the real problem flow that you ran into as possible. Mm, that's a good point. So one of the things we have in our build tool is uh, how all of our CSS comes together. Uh, and I'm, I'm kind of observing lately that React's becoming a little more, or the React ecosystem's becoming a little more opinionated when it comes to CSS and uh, how stuff gets all built together. Why do you think it is that Ember has kind of avoided having opinions about CSS, um, given that we're pretty opinionated about everything else? Yeah, this is uh, this is a good a good question. I, I don't have a solid answer. I can tell you from my personal perspective, I'm just not a CSS expert. Um, I uh, have mostly been um, doing JavaScript for a long time. Um, even when I was just writing app code, not infra code, um, I, I had a, a group of amazing uh, devs that would write the HTML and CSS for us and hand it off for the like the sort of interactivity implementation. Um, and uh, I think, um, I think the no, Godfrey, I did not avoid a question on opinion. Um, I am just not there yet. I haven't gotten to the answer yet. Um, the, um, I think the, the short version is, I think we are considering styles broadly. Um, some of the designs, for example, the template tag, um, are going to, um, they're, they're, for example, like having a template tag in a class, um, uh, is is probably something you should also be able to have some sort of way to specify styles in the same way. Um, I think it's probably reasonable um, to do something to the effect of CSS modules, though I don't, I don't know that that's a panacea either, but something to that effect. Um, but having um, having a way to have your styles in your component that are scoped to your component properly, um, that that feature, uh, which you can get in other, other ways, uh, but um, having that sort of integration would be really good. I think part of the problem is parsing styles, like what kind of, do you want to write SAS? Is it less? Is it stylus? Is that even a thing still? Like, I don't know, whatever. Mm -hmm. But the, um, all of that, um, all of that stuff is, is a bit rough. 
um, yeah. to, to sort of assume. I think if we assume CSS in a sort of quote unquote post CSS world, um, then, um, then I think that's, that's probably like a reasonable thing. Um, I think we probably should do something like that. I think as we get further on the GJS and GTS implementation side, I think we should absolutely consider adding style. But uh, for what it's worth, I don't think it should be limited to that. I think there are other cases that are reasonable to have that are also associated to components. You could imagine queries. You can imagine GraphQL queries that are for a component um, that are co-located. Um, anything where uh, useful co-location um, for a different language type, uh, you know, could apply. Uh, but I do think style is is a great example because I think there's some really useful things that we might want to do. Um, you know, you, you might want to just style p tags and not have to worry about the fact that you're going to be scoped properly to your own template, as, as an example. And now that we have the template tag that goes inside of a class body, that scoping becomes much more logical. Yeah, I think one CSS um, thing I'm looking forward to is layers. Uh, which I think is just going to add a whole new level <laughs> of CSS complexity to our lives. But um, I think one CSS thing that I'll never get on board with is probably CSS and JS. Like that's one that just seems, you're, you're just asking for a nightmare from the start. Um, oh, we have a question from one of our viewers. Um, any thoughts on Ember or Ember data working with non-standard REST APIs or WebSockets? Today, it feels like fighting against conventions when it's not an option to use a JSON API backend. Yeah, I think um, uh, it's a good question. Um, I think to, I, I, like I'm of a couple of minds here. And uh, first of all, uh, as with all the rest of the things, these are my personal opinions and aren't an official position uh, by the Ember core team. Um, but the, uh, I think Ember data is actually quite good in the case that you described of JSON, like a backend you control that is well-formed JSON API. It actually works really good and it's out of the box. It's a good experience. If you're if you're ramping out a project and you're controlling both server, the backend server, API server stuff and the front end, it's a great choice. Um, I think, um, unfortunately, I am never in that situation these days. I'm always in a situation of working with a non JSON API API, uh, non uh, JSON API TM API, because yeah, they're yeah. all JSON APIs. Right, right, right. So I really think those guys are really trying to troll us with the names. Um, yes. But uh, the, um, the, the, I think the answer for us probably needs to be that. We um, that we make it clear that Ember Data is a good solution, a good solution to you to start with, but isn't the only solution. I think um, going with something like Apollo, uh, if you're using a GraphQL side of things, um, is going to work fine. It's going to be it's going to be pleasant, and the experience will be good. Um, and uh, and it should be it should be clear in the Ember ecosystem that that kind of thing. Um, it's totally safe. And it, it's not like other things where you're like going down this weird path yeah. that is away from the herd, you know, which is a thing that we tend to frown on because, you know, we, we, right. we tend right. to really like being in the, the sort of default stack, normal setup for Ember developers. Um, so I think there's some nuance that we have to deal with there. I think personally, it, it wouldn't be surprising to me if in the next while Ember data itself wasn't just, wasn't part of the default blueprint unless you opted into it. Um, uh, but the guides would still talk about it. The, we'd still walk through it, but you know, that, that, that's obviously an RFC. There's a lot of discussion that's got to happen there. And that, that's not something that we'll, we'll be doing lightly. Um, again, I do think Ember data, um, plus JSON API is a delightful place to be. Um, but when you're not there, it's, um, it's like a salmon swimming upstream. It's cool. It's very, very painful. Um, and, um, and we can get better at that. Um, I, I think there's other things in Ember Data itself, even for JSON APIs, that we can continue to hone and get better on, um, like the the debugging experience of when yeah. your requests sort of run a file. Now, that's mm -hmm. not all. Like a lot of people blame Ember Data for that, but it's not all Ember Data's fault. Like I think <laughs> some of the shenanigans that we're doing with backburner and run loop stitching and whatnot is 
ultimately causing it to be very difficult to debug um, when you have a rejected, uh, like a rejected response or something to, to line that back up with the original call site. That's really hard today. Um, and I think that's something that Ember needs to provide better APIs for. Um, something that, something possibly to um, actually eliminate the run loop. I know we effectively eliminated the run loop from the mental model of most developers in like three, four and higher, we remove the auto run assertion. We, like, we, we've done a lot of work to move away from having to use uh, the run loop at all uh, manually, um, but it's still sort of in your face with uh, RSVP promise resolution and uh, route, um, route hooks and whatnot. And I think um, we probably need to rethink some of that stuff to leverage some of the built-in dev tools that are gonna natively stitch your promise stack traces and your async stacks. Um, there's ways to opt into better debugging and back burner, but you shouldn't have to know magical hoops like some turbo button to push to figure out how to debug stuff. So that makes sense. Uh, in the Ember survey, uh, which we just finished going through the results too, and uh, one of the biggest pain points for users was error messages, or they didn't feel like they got the right error message or enough error messages. They just sort of had to figure out what was going wrong and that was really hard. So that sounds like a good uh, analysis. Yeah, I think it's pretty, it's pretty unfortunate though, um, because I think we consider bad error messages to be a bug. Like fundamentally, it's just a bug. It's not, it's not like we don't care. It's not like we don't want to make good ones. Um, we, they should be good. They should be actionable. They should have links to source code or at least include in as much possible context as, 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 as available. Um, and, um, you know, I, I, I kind of hope that folks um, you know, folks that watch this will, will see that and, and uh, hear that, I mean, sorry, and, uh, and, and file issues for a bad error message. Like, I, I know it's, it's possible to find where their message is coming from in Ember or Ember CLI or pick your tool, Ember template maybe, or whatever tool it is. Um, file a bug. Say, uh, if you have to, say, uh, RWJ Blue said that the error bad error messages are bad. Uh, I found this one and I didn't understand it. Like, that's fine if you if you want to do that. Um, and um, the 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 um we should we should make them better uh, some cases are really hard like i'm not saying it's always simple there's always yeah. an answer um yeah. but it should be it should be able to be better i think one thing that we probably should do better about is linking more fleshed out docs on the like for deprecations you get the deprecation which i, I know is not an error but you get a deprecation and there's almost always a link to a, a place to go read about the thing um, yeah i think we should start fleshing out the that same thing for assertions where you can go that and would be a great idea on, at the very yeah. least as an infrastructure i'm not saying every assertion must have a documentation link or something but right, for right. cases where there's common questions or common problems from folks we should totally be able to use the tooling that we have that already will print a url for deprecations and the, the internal tooling is roughly the same so we should totally do That's that a good point all requests oh. welcome <laughs> so um in all of your time working on a framework, have your ideas maybe shifted or changed, or I'm assuming they have, because they all do for all of us. How did have your ideas shifted or changed um, about what a framework should do or should not do? How yeah, has that think, evolved over uh, time? Th this, is, this is a good question. I think the, um, the the main area that I'd say my thinking has sort of changed and uh, evolved over time is the um, the exact balance of convention over configuration. Um, I still absolutely believe that um, we should have a nice conventional out of the box experience, and um, you shouldn't have to have a bunch of boilerplate in your app code that you don't ever touch and that is only framework level. Um, so I, I, I haven't changed positions on that, but I do think that that doesn't mean there can't be a way for you to figure that out. Um, so um, older Ember, like Ember, early days of Ember, um, there was a lot of magically generated stuff that like can, stuff would get met, like uh, instantiated for you that weren't ever in your project. Where did they come from? Ah, who knows? Um, uh, stuff like that. Um, I think um, also exactly where can you bootstrap uh, how things are wired together. How do you how do you um, 
how do you wire together the router and the um, the the um, the resolver and all that stuff? Like today, you have app slash app.js and you import both things and then you set them on your application. Like that that's fine, that's great. Um, but I think um, I think we can we should go further in that direction um, where um, you know it's still not in your app. But, uh, but there could be an import from a shared location. And if you wanted to, you could step into that import and you could go see what's going on. And it should be easy to understand. Um, I think uh, the testing refactors that we've been through, I mean, I know it's not recent now, but uh, over the last couple of years um, have really uh, sort of highlighted the way I like to think about these things. Um, in the test side now, you import from the thing that's actually providing functionality. So in the case of setup, uh, setup test or setup rendering test or whatever, you import a name that describes the type of test and that import comes from a thing that provides the functionality. And if you step into it, you'll see it's composed of other lower level parts and you can go step into those from Ember test helpers. Um, you, when you wanna use click and other interaction uh, helpers, you import them from Ember test helpers. They're not magically available on window um, because how do you even know where they come from? What, where do you go read documentation? So I think that sort of um, wiring is the kind of thing is my is is much closer to my current line of thinking here. Um, it, again, it it is is far from your app must have lots of boilerplate. Though I know some people probably dislike having um, four or five imports in their files, um, like versus before where you had one and it was all these globals were present. So I know that's a trade off, but um, but I think uh, broadly speaking, it is a good one. Because now you can you can logically say, oh, this comes from Ember test helpers. And guess what? We have actually pretty good API docs over Ember test helpers. If you go look at them, yes, like they're if you good. know that they're coming, you go Great. look at them, and you can see what's going on. Um, and I think uh, ideally, you can also step into the code, and it's it's not crazy land. It's it's actually reasonable and understandable, and you can figure out what's going on. Um, th those are all sort of the 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 style of things that we want to do. And I think um, broadly, you'll see that, that is also the thing that we're doing on Ember itself. Um, Octane is a good example. We got rid of, at least in the mental model, a lot of the custom shenanigans that were replaced by uh, normal JS classes. Um, and I think Polaris can get even further by removing like magical air quotes, uh, dot get and set methods and, you know, evented details and whatnot. If you want evented, that's great. It's a good pattern to use sometimes. Um, but like there is a hundred evented pattern packages on NPM. Go use one of them. We don't have to mm -hmm. make it. Like we're not going to be right. original in that space. Um, and uh, there's no, there's no reason for it to be an ember. Right. Um, yeah. You know, speaking of wiring things up, I was looking at a new framework called Astro, which supposedly allows you to use like some view components and some React components and whatever features you like from whatever framework and kind of stitch them together. Mm -hmm. uh, and I was watching a Q&A with Dan Abramov um, the other day and, and he gave a interesting kind of response to the trade-offs that you would kind of encounter as something like going outside of your ecosystem to maybe pull in something like a component from React or a, a web component itself. Um, what are some of those trade-offs in an Ember app? Like what would we lose by using say a web component instead of an Ember component or a React component instead of an Ember component? Uh, can you talk us through some of that? Um, I can, although I am far from the best person to talk about it, but the, the web component case is the easiest uh, because web components are um, specifically limited in the, the way you pass data. Um, I think Ember users would find it to be very frustrating to be limited to only passing essentially JSON stringifiable data as attributes. Um, you can work around some of that by setting properties, but every web component defines its own mechanism for reading those properties. Um, the, the way you interact with them is, is uh, you know, you'd have to provide callbacks and whatnot. Like the, it just, it would feel um, less great for higher level components. I think it, I think they are a good choice for, in a lot of cases for like leaf components, like UI only components or something to that effect. Um, but, but I think, um, Broadly, I, I think that the the case where you you know you're you're building a you know a, a post editor or something where you're going to have data passed into you and it's a high level thing and you want to be able to call save and it's got interaction ability and, and whatnot. I think those cases are quite 
frustrating and you could totally author a web component that does it and does it well, but the web components general spec doesn't really give advice on how to do that. Um, so right. you're basically just making your own sub version of web components anyways. Um, but to talk about React uh, or Svelte or Vue or whatever arbitrary like X framework interaction in Ember, I think it's totally a thing that we should uh, we should continue fleshing out. It is totally possible to embed um, React in an Ember app and have either, you can do it a bunch of different ways, but you can, that's definitely a thing. And you can interact with the React components, um, passing high level data and back and forth. Uh, I think that's, that's totally a thing you can do. Now, um, should we have that Thank be you. like a default officially supported thing? I'm not sure. Um, I do think that there's absolute cases, especially at like larger companies where you've got, um, you've got applications that want to leverage the same underlying code and you don't really want to write it four times and you don't control what they right. wrote the other thing in. So like, right. yeah, I, I get it. Like that's, that's a thing, you know, you might want to use the shared messenger widget, but you don't really want to, um, you, you want to be a number there written in react and you know, you don't, you don't want to rewrite and you don't want to duplicate their UI. Um, you know, so that, that's the thing like that, that does make sense. Um, the, but I think, I think in that case, I think we should have just a better embedding story. Um, mm. and, uh, I, mean, I think what we, we should, we should work on it. There's a, an RFC open that I've just was reviewing the other day about, um, avoiding globals and making embedding easier. Um, and I think, uh, hopefully we can, we can push that forward. Uh, that, that helps out a lot of, a lot of these edge cases. Um, there's, there's another problem in this space of wiring multiple frameworks together. And that's that the semantics of the various frameworks are all different. Yeah. Um, now they're similar, but different. Um, and, um, I don't think every combination of every framework, uh, sh is, is going to be a good fit together. Some will work well, some won't. Um, I do think that we should continue pushing forward some of the ideas that uh, Yehuda was talking about with Starbeam, I think in his uh, fireside chat, I think it was. Um, but, um, but we should continue fleshing that out in terms of how does that work in Ember? Um, because the, the spirit here is that Starbeam can provide an easy re way to opt into the type of reactivity that we're used to in a React world with hooks. And I think we could also do the same thing in Vue um, and et cetera. So we can, so it's not quite the same as what the question was, but, um, uh, included in the question is, well, if you had all these frameworks, how the hell does data flow work? Um, yeah. how do you force re-rendering? How does, how does that stuff works? And when you go through each layer, do you have to wire up the data flow in each level? Like that would suck. Right. Anyway. So I think, I think it's all intertwined and I think it's, um, actively sort of the kind of thing that we're pushing on. Good to know. Um, I always wonder, like, at what point will we not have components at all? We'll just be using web components. Um, but I really like Ember's component story. And um, I don't think I'm looking to switch anytime soon until it's well, just we as easy. Oh, but what we do, we use components and we host them on the web. They're web components. Oh, right. I've missed your yeah. puns, man. All right. Um, what is the thing that everyone thinks is hard in Ember, but isn't? Maybe we oh, just don't explain um, it well, or we don't have good error messages, but what's the one thing everyone's like, oh my God, it's so hard. And you're like, no. I think, uh, I, I, well, I don't know. I think there, it's a hard one. Let me, let me think. So, um, there's a few things that I think are are in that realm, um, but I think lots of them have had good explainers now. Um, for example, uh, um, Chris Garrett wrote a series of blog posts talking about the reactivity model. He also gave a talk at the last year's, I think last year's summer conference, maybe it was two years, I don't know. Um, but the about the Octane reactivity model and how it worked and all that jazz. And I think that, um, the a lot of people can think that is very very difficult like re, the you know how does tract work how do we reinval how do we validate all how does all that work and ultimately that's pretty straightforward um 
it, uh, I just suggest you could read it, blog posts. Um, the other thing is um, a lot of people think there's like this sort of black box around how the router works and how things uh, go in that realm. Um, the router microlib code is not super simple to read, but um, the conceptual thing that it does is pretty straightforward. Um, and I think the that that library will be massively cleaned up once we can once we refactor it. Oh, now that we don't support I eleven, we can just use async await, and it'll actually make it a lot easier to reason about native promises and async await probably. Um, and um, I think uh, think that'll that'll help there as well. Um, what else? I think the the run loop itself is also like surprisingly simple. The whole thing is what a thousand lines of code or something. It's not that complicated to reason about. It's just dealing with anything around evented and asynchrony is yeah. annoying and hard. So like you end up talking down a hard path. Yeah. I've always thought that we need to add more diagrams to our documentation, like conceptually, visually explain what we're doing and then the code. Uh, but you know, time, who has time to do that? Oh, that's a PR yeah. idea. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. All right, um, let's see. Well, we have one more question from the audience and I think that will wrap it up for us. Um, do you have any thoughts on packager agnostic plugins? Right now, if a V2 add-on author wants to provide some build time stuff, they need to provide a Webpack plugin or some other bespoke transform. Uh, what's this look like when Embroider supports multiple packagers? Oh, multiple packagers. Do add-on authors need to rewrite their plugins for each packager? Uh, good question. Okay, so there's, uh, so first of all, the short answer is yes, right now. Um, I think until we have um, the ability to serialize or synthesize the things that those plugins are doing in terms of things that we already provide agnostic tooling for, like things you could do with embroidered macros, for example, um, you, uh, you're going to be forced to write N plugins. Now, uh, and that, that does feel bad, but also um, it's not that bad. We don't really expect terribly large number of um of folks to have to write these custom plugins. Um, th there's a handful of really specific cases that are common that we think will probably exist. Things like GraphQL, um, hooking in and compiling your GraphQL um, and whatnot. Um, so that's totally a thing that you you would need a plugin for if you had any sort of customizations. The But, uh, but I think um, we don't expect the number of people that have to offer to those to be a massive uh, sort of lift, uh, or sorry, a large number. We think lots of apps will use them, but everyone won't be writing them. Um, so uh, in those cases, factoring those things to be able to provide shared interfaces that can be shared amongst the plugin for the various packages they care about, I think is, is a thing that's it's fine. Um, I don't think it's great, but it's fine. Um, I think the ability to support multiple packages is quite important and we need to quickly get there, um, in my opinion. Um, so that we we don't um, accidentally solidify ourselves and be stuck with just Webpack, for example. Um, yeah. I would love to see us uh, go to Mo or Vite or whatever, but I think the the broad the broad problem is um, we are intentionally decoupling, which means some category of problems are harder, and those category uh, that category of problems ends up um, uh, ends up still being um, a somewhat difficult lift, and we need to make RFCs to make those things better. For example, you could imagine um, you can imagine writing a thing, uh, at least for a, at least a couple of these. Um, you could write a library that wraps a rollup and Webpack and provides the interfaces needed for both of them. And you, you know, I mean, largely the sets of hooks that exist for these plugins are basically the same. You know, there's like do the thing. Here's your source. Go do the transpilation, for example. Um, yeah. So you could totally do that. Um, and in heck, I'm not even saying that does not exist. Someone should look. I, I, I bet someone wrote this. Uh, it probably does <laughs> exist. It's not like if I'm, I'm, it's unlikely to be a unique thought that I had. Um, the um, yeah, I just I think I think that's that's all path. Again, that's going to have pitfalls too. Not pitfalls. It'll have uh, gaps uh, as well because every packaging doesn't support every combination of hooks and style of intercepting activity. Um, you know, so there might be. Uh, gaps in in like a general purpose wrapping thing, but um, 
if the point is the the simplest lowest level functionality i think we could probably write a like a shared wrap my transform function in a in a frame in a sorry a plugin wrapper thing that works um i think that's probably possible awesome well we're just about at time um or as much time as we said we'd do this for <laughs> So thank you so much, Rob, for um, being willing to do this AMA. Uh, and it's been awesome to chat and catch up and think about the future. I hope you have a great day. And thanks to everyone for watching. Um, hope to see you soon. Thank you, y'all.